Okay, perhaps let me start just with uh, a couple of gentle remarks and uh, and recap. So just I, I recording. Yes. So um, we introduced uh, yesterday this notation about um, a formula or a, sorry a sentence being a logical consequence of a theory, right? But let me give you an intuition of what what this basically means. For example, with the theory of groups, <clears throat> right? So the theory of groups we were saying this was just a finite set of axioms basically stating that the, just the usual axioms that you see for groups and if i take for example the the set of all sentences which in the language of groups which are logical consequence consequences of the of the theory of groups with well, th this is basically all the sentences that are true in all groups right because this was a relation saying that if anything is a model of this part, it has also to be a model of this part, right? So this set is basically group theory for first order sentences, right? This is just all the sentences that actually hold in all groups, right? And there are, of course, plenty of such sentences. For example, something like uh, for all x, for all y, if x, y equals one, then um, actually y is equal to x minus one, right? So something like saying that the inverses are unique, right? This is not part of, of, of this set, but for sure it is a logical consequence, right? So if you think of this set, this is actually all the sentences that are going to be true in every group, right? So this is why we're thinking of logical consequence. I mean, uh, as, as something which is going to be true in all models of this. And if this is precisely the theories, the, the axioms for groups, then this set is basically saying, well, this is these are all the sentences that that hold in all groups. So knowing this set basically will give you uh, all that is true uh, for groups, but only for first order. Of course, there are plenty of. Is there a notion of probabilities? For example, if I have two sentences that I declare as an axiom. Yes. If I make the conjunction, this is a true theory. Um, correct. I mean, of if course. I make the is a false theory. That's correct. And uh, is there a set of rules that allows to construct every sentence that is true uh, from the actions by formal manipulation? Yes, but this is something that I'm not definitely. This is something I'm not doing in this course. This has to do with with this. Yes, this this is in, in, in other courses of logic or something. This will be something that is noted just with one arrow. <laughs> and this means phi follows from these axioms only using a finite number of these axioms and some of the rules of first order logic, like uh, modus ponens and this type of uh, operations. And what you show in a course of logic is that this is the case if and only if this is the case. This, this is what is known as, as the completeness theorem, right? This is Gödel's completeness theorem, that uh, if a formula follows deductively from a theory, this is exactly the same equivalent as it follows in this sense, that every model of T has to be a model of this one. I'm not covering anything of this in this course, and I'm doing everything semantically if you want i'm not doing any syntaxis or uh, deductive calculus but this is also a way in which one one can work and uh, so below is called semantic abstract is called syntax if you want or deductive and this is kind of a, a semantic implication or just it, it it says nothing about a formal deduction from this from this it only says something about models it says if i have a model of t it has to be a model of of phi but yes, we. I'm sorry for my lack of culture. It's okay, it's okay. But the length in incompleteness theorem is of second order logic. No, no, no. Gödel's incompleteness theorem is going to say something about the incompleteness of the theorem of Peano arithmetic, for example. So we, we defined what a complete theory was, right? We defined, we said a theory is complete, right? 
if uh, for every uh, sentence, let's say L theory and L sentence, phi, either phi follows from T or the negation follows from T, right? Gödel's incompleteness theorem, or one way to phrase it, because it's perhaps perhaps a little bit more, uh, a little bit, right? The, the formulation I'm going to give is not the more general one, but it's going to say that if I take T to be this piano arithmetic that I gave you, the axioms, first order axioms of piano arithmetic that I gave you, then this theory is not complete. Is not. Complete. Okay, so there are going to be sentences which are, it, they don't follow logically from piano arithmetic, but their negation also does not follow from piano arithmetic. And one would expect. It's not really clear. That's, because, that's. Because you, you, in the case of groups, it was obvious that it was incomplete. I agree, so I why, agree. Why you didn't make sense? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. Well, Gödel's theorem is a little bit more, um, it's, well, it's a little bit more general. It also implies, for example, that anything that kind of interprets this arithmetic, it's going to be also incomplete. For example, set theory, the axioms for set theory. This is also an incomplete theory. And if you think it, this is a little bit strange because you would like, also for piano arithmetic, you would like, uh, I mean, this is trying to axiomatize what is true in the natural numbers, right? Without using the natural numbers, but, but just the difficulty to do it for piano arithmetic for other theories it is easy. Well, the yes, I, I, I agree. I agree. The, the the I mean the main part of the proof is show that piano arithmetic is incomplete, but this is not a simple task because you need to you need to really find a formula which is it does not follow from piano arithmetic or its negation is that does not follow right and this is not easy actually the yes. Yes, exactly. The theorem is piano, piano, piano arithmetic is not complete. Correct. Okay. Correct. And piano arithmetic in, in, in first order, right? Because we know in second order it has only one model. So any everything that is true or not in the natural numbers, it, it will follow from logically from uh, from the axioms in second order. But here this is not the case. Okay. Good. So Yeah, absolutely right. You're absolutely right. This 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 is something about theories, and this is called the completeness theorem. This has nothing to do with the completeness of a theory. It's confusing. I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. Sorry. In in a sense, there is a way in which you can try to make this a little bit. I mean, it they they have something in common, but. Let me not get into these details. I, I agree that there is no. Right, th there is a way in which you can try to, to, to see this as, a, as something is complete, but let me not get into, into these details. Okay, so we saw indeed that, for instance, group theory was not a, a complete theory. And it would be nice if we just work with complete theories. So th those are theories in which already the theory is going to determine uh, um, every sentence, right? Now, <clears throat> let me give you, even before we go again into the discussion of uh, groups that we left uh, yesterday, which, if the theory of, uh, which was it, infinite, uh, no, sorry, torsion-free abelian groups was, uh, um, was complete or not. Let me give you, because you were kind of using it, let, let me give you a criterion to know if a theory is complete. So, it's a lemma. Uh, an L theory uh, T is complete if and only if for every pair, well, every pair of models of models, every pair M and N of models of T, uh, let's put it like this for every pair. Uh, it holds that there must be elementary equivalent. Okay, 
So being complete is exactly the same as if you give me two models of this theory, they must be elementary and equivalent. So in particular, this, this is saying about piano arithmetic that you can find two different models of piano arithmetic. They satisfy exactly the same axioms, but that they don't satisfy exactly the same sentences. So this is kind of, well, not very pleasant, right? You would like to, to, to have really a theory which is kind of capturing exactly which sentences are true or not in the natural numbers. But this is telling you that you're going to find also models of piano arithmetic which satisfy other sentences, which is well kind of unpleasant if you're trying to really capture a structure. You would like to really capture what is true in, in the natural numbers, but these axioms do not suffice to capture that, right? Okay, let's prove, let's prove this theorem. So this uh, direction, right? So suppose T is complete, right? Suppose T is complete and take, let M and N be two models of, of T, right? We need to show that they are elementary equivalent, so they satisfy the same sentences. So uh, let phi be an L sentence. So we have that if M satisfies uh, this formula phi, then let's show that this is, uh, well, let's show this is if and only if T, for example, does not imply the negation, right? Let's try to understand why. Because on the contrary, right? Otherwise, if T really implies the negation, since M is a model of T, then M would have to also satisfy the negation, right? Let, let me put it like this. If not, right? If T really uh, implies the negation, since M is a model of T, this implies that M needs to be a model of not phi, but this contradicts that we're assuming that M is a model of, of phi, right? So this definitely implies that T does not uh, imply not phi, right? But T is complete. This is why, since T is complete, since it has to imply either the formula or its negation, and I'm not implying the negation, this implies that T implies phi, right? <clears throat> Actually, this is an if and only if, right? We agree? I mean, if, if, if T satisfies the negation and I have models, T cannot imply both of them. You agree? I cannot have a contradiction because a contradiction is never satisfied in any model, right? So this is an if and only if between these two. Okay, oops. <clears throat> okay, so this is then also an if and only if, right? Because if T satisfies phi, and we know that M is a model of T, well, M has to satisfy phi. You agree? So for the moment we have ifs and only ifs everywhere. Now, if T satisfies phi, since N is a model of T, well, this also is an if and only if N satisfies phi, right? And uh, well, there is nothing particular between N and M, so of course here we also have a, an if and only if. So this means M satisfies the formula, if and only if N satisfies the formula, which means that these two are elementary equivalent. Okay, let's prove the... Can you quickly recall the definition of the three lines? Yes, these three lines, exactly this if and only if, that if one structure satisfies a sentence, the other has to satisfy two and vice versa, right? Now for the other direction, right? Now suppose, uh, well, 
suppose for every pair of models m and n of t, we have that uh, m is elementary equivalent to n, but that uh, t is not complete, okay? Right, if, if t is not complete, this means, this means what? That there is a formula such that this is not happening, right? So this means there is a sentence, sorry. This means there is an L sentence phi such that phi does not follow from, from T, but it also, it does not follow from, sorry, the negation does not follow from T, right? This is the negation of being complete. Yes? So if I'm not complete, there must be one formula such that neither of these two things is happening. But let, let us see what, 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 what this says. If a formula phi does not follow from a theory, this means that there must exist a model of T, which is not a model of, of phi, right? So this part says there is M, a model of T, such that M does not model phi, right? It, 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 it can happen, right? It can happen, but but okay, but but then this is this is trivially trivially complete if you want. Because okay, let, let, let me, I'll, I'll do this case in a second. Okay. I mean in the, in that case, if this is the case, then T cannot have any model. Right? Because there is no model that satisfies T and then satisfies phi and no phi. Right? And if T has no model, then T is trivially complete because this will hold for any formula because there is no model of T. So any 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 um, statement like this is going to be true by default, by default, right? So this this case I don't we don't consider it too often, so right? Exactly, exactly. If if a theory, I mean, if a theory, let, let me put it perhaps here. Here, if T implies both a formula and its negation, it cannot have models, right? Because if I have a model, then I will have a model that satisfies these two sentences, which is impossible, right? Hence, T is complete by default. Since actually T implies any formula, any sentence, sorry, for any sentence. Right, because since I have no models, well, this is true just uh, by the vacuum, right? Because there is no counterexample to this because I have no model of T. Well, suppose you have a model that, uh, a model of T, then you will be a model of phi and not phi, but there is no structure that can satisfy a sentence and a sentence and its negation. Well, this is just because of the definition of the satisfaction relation, right? We define the satisfaction relation in a way that this cannot happen. Either the relation holds for M and a sentence, or it does not. This is just the way we define the satisfaction relation, right? Because this is a relation and, and a relation, either a pair belongs to the relation or it does not belong to the relation, right? This is the way membership works in mathematics. So this Absolutely, this is, I mean, this is a relation. This symbol is a relation between structures and formulas and given a pair like this, either this relation holds or it does not, right? But we define the negation. So we define this precisely as 
I mean, this, the definition of this was that M is not in the relation with phi. So you cannot be in the relation with phi and not in the relation with phi. It's kind of a meta level of relation if you want. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. This is just, a, if you want, this is a, this is not really a set relation, but a class relation, right? Because I don't have the set of all L structure. This is not a set. But nevertheless, either this holds or this holds, right? It cannot happen that both hold at the same time. OK. So now this, um, this part says that I must have a model of t, which does not satisfy phi. And this one here says there is a model n of t such that n satisfy the negation of phi, right? Uh, but this means if I don't satisfy phi, this is exactly satisfying the negation, right? Hence. No, this this says this has a quantification. This is we are assuming for every pair something is happening. You can you can put m prime here and n prime, right? Hence, m prime here satisfies the negation of phi, and here n satisfies actually phi, right? You agree? But then these two are models of, uh, sorry, n prime. So these two are models of, of t. Our assumption implies that these two must be elementarily equivalent. This is a contradiction because I have two models of t, which should, I mean, they, they should satisfy all the same sentences, but here they are satisfying two different sentences, right? I mean, one and their negation. Okay, so complete theories are those theories such that if you take two models, all the models are elementarily equivalent. I cannot distinguish two models with sentences. Okay, now perhaps before going back to, to this question on groups, let me give you a very nice criterion and very easy, simple criterion to know when uh, a theory is complete, okay? And this is what I was saying that um, before, that if, um, yes, go. This is again by the definition of this relation and the negation. This is the way we define the negation. So this is exactly just by the definition of the negation. That cannot be the case by the definition of this relation. This is the way we define satisfaction. Exactly. This is a model. This is not a theory. So for models, right, for models, it cannot happen that a model satisfies or does not satisfy phi and does not satisfy not phi. This cannot happen. Ex exactly. A model is just fixed and it cannot hold these two things at the same time. For a theory, this is different. For a theory, it could happen that you don't imply phi and you don't imply not phi because well, that's the way we're re writing the symbols, but of course it's different, right? I mean, something is a model and something else is a theory implying a formula. Absolutely. If it's not a sentence, no. If it's not a sentence, it depends where are you evaluating the formula, right? A formula could be true for some A, but false for some other B. Yes? Okay, good, good, good. Um, right. So I was 
we, we were doing again this exercise about saying uh, if your structure is finite, then elementarily equivalence implies already isomorphism. And we said this cannot happen for infinite structures, right? So the next best thing that could happen for, for a theory of infinite structures is the following property. So perhaps I cannot fix, I mean, we, the Lovenheim scaling theorem tell, tell, tells me if my theory has infinite models, I'm going to have models of every cardinality. But perhaps that I have one cardinality in which when they have the same cardinality, they are isomorphic, right? And this is the best thing we can hope for kind of being unique in a sense. And this is what we call categoricity. So this is the definition given uh, an L theory T, <clears throat> given an L theory T, with infinite models. And kappa, an infinite cardinal. We say T is kappa categorical. If every two models of T of cardinality kappa are isomorphic. Uh, of T of cardinality kappa are isomorphic. Okay, so I know I'm gonna find models of T of higher cardinality, but perhaps when I really get to the cardinality kappa, I'm really always isomorphic, right? The Lovingham scaling theorem make, um, makes me go up and down in cardinality, but perhaps. So you can remove infinite cardinality. You can delete finite cardinal, and then the, the theorem says that the theory is categorical. You cannot be it. Uh, this is not an only if, if an only if. In the finite piece. Ah, in the finite piece, yes. That's correct. If an only if That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. So why, why, why to put an infinite cardinal in the statement? You can, so you can leave, you can make this definition uh, of an infinite cardinal. I mean, I, I, I agree. If 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 I if I if I delete and just say kappa category for a cardinal. That 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 that's true. The the, the point of putting the, the the infinite here is that we actually don't care about the finite case because of this argument that we say. It applies. It applies. If you want to say it like this, that's totally fine. Okay. Now let me give you the idea. If if this is kind of a, the, the, the nearest thing to being unique that you can get in first order logic, right? Because we know that we cannot, uh, a theory cannot fix the isomorphism type of, of a structure, right? It cannot because you can go up and down with the Lovingham scaling theorems. But it can fix perhaps the isomorphism type of a given, uh, at a given cardinal, right? And this would be to be kappa categorical. And as you expect, if you are kappa categorical for some uh, cardinal, infinite cardinal kappa, then you are going to be complete. This is this is the case. So this is what it's called the uh, uh, Vought's criterion. What I said is wrong. Vought's criterion <laughs> depends how you phrase it with completeness, but. Right. But, but they said it's only true if the theory only has finite. Ah, so that's correct. That's correct. I agree. So, a theory can also have zero models? Uh, yes. The, precisely the theory of phi and not phi, right? This theory has no model. And a, a theory can also have finite models? Of course. For example, the theory of groups has plenty of finite models, right? You have plenty of finite groups. Did you mean finitely many models? Uh, as well, as well, for example, the formula saying 
there are exactly two elements or there are exactly three elements. You can have a model with two elements and a model with three elements. Sure, but a model would be in the language, in the empty language, a model would be just a set with two elements and another model would be a set with three elements, right? That's just two models of this theory and actually the only two <laughs> that it will have, right? Okay, what's criterion says, um, let D be uh, a theory uh, with infinite models. Uh, which is Kappa categorical. Categorical. For Kappa, of course, again, uh, an infinite cardinal. Um, <laughs> right, with, I, I have to be precise, with Kappa at least the bigger than the cardinality of, um, of the language uh, and LF zero, right? has to be infinite, but it also must be bigger than the than the cardinality of your language. Then T is complete. Let us prove this theorem is not is not very uh, not very difficult. So we're going to prove that. Uh, we're going to just just the the, the 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 lemma that we just wrote. In order to prove that T is complete, we're going to show that any two models of this theory are elementarily equivalent. Okay. So we show that any two models of T are elementarily equivalent. Okay. Sorry. Yes, this is the three line symbol exactly. Oh, sorry. I, I, I should have said a theory with only, here is important, with only infinite models. I don't want a theory that has finite models. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Because he, he's saying exactly you're you're daily you're saying exactly the proof. The idea is that exactly he's 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 basically giving the proof. So the idea is we have three cases basically, or perhaps four, but case one, this is the most uh, uh, stupid uh, case is that if both m and n have cardinality kappa, right? Well, then since I'm categorical, they're isomorphic, they need to be elementarily equivalent, right? Since I'm categorical, since T is kappa categorical, then M is isomorphic to N, which implies in particular that they are elementarily equivalent, right? Let's do another case. Case uh, two, for example, let's suppose that we need to distinguish between cases where sits kappa with respect to these two models, right? For example, let's suppose that uh, M, oh, sorry, that the cardinality of M that both are, are smaller or equal than, than kappa. Right? Perhaps one of them is really strictly smaller, otherwise we're still once, once, once more in, the, in this case, right? Suppose that kappa is already bigger than these two, but these two, we know they're infinite, right? Then by Lovingham's column upwards, right? Lovingham's column, we can find the following. We have here M, right? There is here an elementary extension n, sorry, m star, which is m star is of cardinality kappa. Here I have n, and I also use the upward words, uh, upwards Lovingham scrolling to find an elementary extension of size kappa. 
right? By categoricity, these two have size kappa, then they must be isomorphic. There is an isomorphism between these two. So this is by, this is kappa categoricity. Oops. But then these two are elementary equivalent, right? Because one is an elementary substructure of the other. These two have to be elementary equivalent because there is an isomorphism and these two as well, right? So this whole thing implies that M is elementary equivalent to M star, which is elementary equivalent to N star, and this is elementary equivalent to N. And of course, being elementary equivalent is an equivalence relation, so we can conclude that M and N are elementarily equivalent, right? And you can play this game now going down or up as you want. Let me do the case three, but this is, the, 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 the argument is the same. The argument is, is not complicated. Let me do the case, the case three, right? Suppose for example, we have that the cardinality of M, oops, is smaller or equal than Kappa and this is, is more or equal than n, right? And in this case, what you do is you have, here you have m, you go up with Lovingham's column. Here you have n, which is bigger, but you go down with the downwards Lovingham's column to, to some n here, a star, right? Here I used upwards, and this one is downwards. And I choose them so that uh, the cardinality of M star is kappa. And of course, the cardinality here of N star is again kappa. And then categoricity gives me between these two, again, an isomorphism, right? So again, these two have to be elementary equivalent, these two elementary equivalent, and these two as well. I found some path of elementary equivalence between between them. Okay, there is perhaps another case, but you can perhaps I'm missing the case where kappa is below m and n, but then you use downwards uh, twice, right? Or let me not do it. The case the case four is uh, see. So, which one? Case one. Case one. Okay, case one is included in 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 this one, perhaps. I agree. Or or and yes, I agree. You're right. I was just trying to <laughs> to make the idea. Uh, isomorphic, uh, can you quickly recall isomorphism? Isomorphism. So an isomorphism was an that there exists a function which is an L embedding, which is also bijective, which is also surjective, right? And the isomorphic implies equivalent isomorphism. This is part of your homework today. <laughs> Being isomorphism is, is even stronger, right? Because if you think of it, an isomorphism should really preserve all the structure, right? An isomorphism not only preserves sentences, but preserves even formulas, right? If a formula holds for some elements, it's going to hold for the image of this element. And if you don't have even elements, if those are sent just sentences, this, then for sure this is going to be true, right? An isomorphism is, well, if you think of it as something that really preserves, it, it's making identical the two structures, so they better satisfy the same sentences. Sorry? Uh, not necessarily. No, in this case, isomorphism, I mean. Oh, an isomorphism can be any function, just any function that preserves, which is bijective, right? And preserves, and it's an L embedding, which means it's really preserving every relation, every function, and every constant. That's, that's what it means. So for sure, the other direction doesn't work. 
of 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 what of this of this ah no that's what we that's what we said about Lovingham's column you can have two elementary equivalent structures but having different cardinality so there is no bijection exactly this is what we said this the other implication is for sure not true um, with infinite structures that's correct No, if it has, ah, okay, yes, that's that's not clear because w we need, in order to apply Lovingham's calling, uh, we need these two, these two to have uh, the right cardinality with respect to the language. There were some some conditions on how to to use Lovingham's column, right? Yes. It's, I mean, we could sort of change, we could invent a, a new definition of only for infinite models. And this proof would work with or without. I mean, if we wanted to restrict everything only to infinite models, I agree. And we call this like you know a different kind of completeness, then this would work. Right? Absolutely. And but a priori, it's not like I mean the proof wouldn't work if we allow um, the theory to have finite models. But yes, could, be, could the theorem still hold? Because uh, well, the, no. The the problem for now. This is this is not true. Okay. The, you can have examples of, 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 of theories which, I mean, for example, if I'll, I'll try to give you later an example of theories which are going to have finite models, but if I don't remove this part of the theory, even having, even, even if it is categorical at some level, then the theory is not going to be complete. Precisely because you're going to have formulas which are going to hold in some of the finite models, but not in the infinite ones, right? Because the formula already saying I only have uh -huh. n elements yeah, yeah, cannot follow from from both, right? This is basically the the point. Sorry, no, no, no. It's a it's a good it's a good question. Okay, let let us now use this to see some complete theories because up to now we haven't seen any complete theory besides just the theory of a model, which is kind of uh, not so interesting. Well, I mean, it's interesting, but it's not kind of a really an axiomatization of the theorem. I'm just giving you a whole set which is already complete, but not perhaps something more interesting. And when you see the kind of um, examples um, I will give you, you will kind of understand uh, the point of this. So let me start with uh, vector spaces. This is this is kind of easy. So let uh, let's say K be a field, and uh, let me call uh, the theory of K. Let me put it here, or perhaps vector spaces over K, which are going to be let me put here this infinite infinite vector spaces over K. This is a theory that we can. This is going to be the theory. Let, let me give you the language. In the language, in the language of k vector spaces, which is plus minus, I have the zero, and I have a unary function for every element in k, which, which is basically trying to mimic uh, scalar multiplication. Okay, so I need one function for every k because k is not going to appear into my structure the only thing which is going to be the structure is the abelian group underlying the vector space okay and scalar multiplication is just i have one symbol for every scalar multiplication okay so this theory is well you need to say uh you need to put the 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 whole theory of abelian groups right with respect to these three symbols you need to say that your underlying vector space is a is an abelian group you need to list uh, uh, an infinite uh, set of axioms saying how these scalars uh, behave, right? I mean, you need to put stuff like uh, uh, if I multiply the scalar zero, something like this, sorry. For every x, if I multiply the scalar zero uh, with, I mean, if I apply the scalar zero to x, this is going to be the zero vector. Don't confuse this zero with this one, right? This is the constant symbol of my language, and this is just an element of k, right? A particular function here. 
I need to say also that uh, for every x, lambda of one of x is actually just x. And I need to punch, I also need to say something, stuff like this, right? For every x, for every y, uh, lambda a of x plus y is equal to lambda a x plus lambda a y, right? Something that, and, and I need to add this action for every a in k, right? This is a not just one action, but one for every a in k. I also need to say stuff like uh, for every x, something like lambda a plus b of x is also lambda of ax plus lambda of bx, right? And I need to do this as well for every pair a, b in k. So this is a huge list of axioms, right? And I think I also need to say something about multiplication. Lambda of a times b of x is equal to lambda a lambda b of x. And again, this is for all a, b in k. And finally, I need to say something about this is infinite, but we know how to say this, right? I, I say there exists x1, there exists xn, and they're all different. Okay, for every n in the natural numbers. So this is a huge list, list of axioms, but basically this is the axioms you know for vector spaces, right? This is not nothing complicated. I'm just listing really all the axioms you put for in a course in linear algebra. I'm just putting them all there and saying at least my uh, my vector space is going to be infinite. Okay, let us show this theorem. This theory, vector spaces or k infinity, is uh, kappa categorical for any kappa which is bigger than, um, strictly bigger, let's say, than the cardinality of k. Let me call it lambda, perhaps, lambda categorical so that we don't. Miss it lambda categorical for any cardinal bigger than k and aleph zero. So if I'm really bigger than, if I am uncountable and bigger than the cardinality of k, perhaps I started with a very big field k, I don't know. If I'm bigger than these two, then actually I am cat gamma categorical, uh, lambda categorical. Any guess why this, this should be? If you, if you give me two vector spaces, right? What, what we need to show is that if you give me two vector spaces over K, which have cardinality lambda, they need to be isomorphic. This is what this basically is saying, right? I mean, to show that, let's, let's give the proof, right? This is saying any, any two models, right? Any two models, models uh, M and N of this, theory are isomorphic. Right? Yes. I, since we're strictly bigger than the cardinality field um, and bigger than countable, then I mean, we know that the, the, the dimension has to be like. Exactly like, lambda. Right. Exactly. This, this is the point. So take any two models. Oh, sorry. Of cardinality. Sorry. Of cardinality lambda right we need to show right let me put like this take two models of cardinality lambda then those are vector spaces right if you give me a basis for a vector space like this what is this is the, the, the what is its cardinality what what is the dimension of such a vector space it has to be lambda right because well, this is just a, a fact, right? If, if, if your vector space is of size bigger than countable, right? If, 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 your, if your vector space was countable, then perhaps you can have a cardinality. Your dimension could be one or two or three or four, but at most countable, right? 
But if you have an uncountable vector space, you need an uncountable basis, right? Because linear combinations, they don't exceed count countable many objects, right? If you have a countable basis and you take linear combinations of those, you end up with a countable vector space, right? So if your vector, if your vector space was uncountable, you need at least uncountably many, well, at least exactly that many uh, um, elements in your basis to get the right number of the vector space because linear combinations don't exceed, they're just finitely many symbols uh, trying to, to get these, these many vectors. So this implies that the dimension, the dimension of M equals the dimension of N equals lambda. But you know from linear algebra that if two vector spaces have the same dimension, just over the same field, just sending any bijection between the bases gives you an isomorphism of vector spaces. So if this is the case, then M has to be isomorphic to N, right? It's a very simple proof that these two are isomorphic. So this is saying that this theory is actually complete, right? It, it has a funny consequence. For example, let me give you just some simple consequence of this, knowing that this is complete. For example, you cannot say in this language, in the language, for example, in the language of, uh, let me call it like this. We, I didn't say what, let me call it uh, K, K, let me call it here, vector spaces over K. This is my language. In the language of vector spaces, vector spaces over the reals, for example, one cannot say, cannot express by a sentence, by an L, V, R sentence, uh, the property of having, for example, dimension two. This is not possible. And let me give you a proof uh, uh, why. If, if this was expressible by a formula, then, well, let me give you the, the third proof. Indeed, since this theory, the theory that we just gave of uh, infinite vector spaces over the reals, right? This is a complete theory, right? By, by both stats test, this is a, I, I didn't say it, but for, I mean, this is an immediate corollary. Corollary, the theory of vector spaces over K, which are infinite is complete, right? Then since, since this is complete, this vector space, and all the lambdas, right? This and this one are elementarily equivalent, right? Here, of course, the, the plus is coordinate plus. This is just the usual sum as a vector space of R squared, right? These two are two models of this theory, right? This is an infinite vector space over R, this is also a vector space over R, right? This has dimension two, but this has dimension one, and they satisfy the same sentences because the theory is complete. So any two models have to be elementarily equivalent. So it, it cannot be the case that this property is expressible by a sentence because it would hold either in both or in none, right? So as vector spaces, I, we cannot tell the difference with a sentence between these two. This, this is, it, it seems surprising, but it is saying that this language is very poor, actually, right? 
what he's saying is that the, the language is not very expressible. We cannot express a lot. I already cannot distinguish these two vector spaces, one from each other using a sentence in this language. I mean, it seems surprising at the very beginning, but what it says is a little bit something bad about this language is saying, okay, well, it's kind of disappointing. I, I would like to distinguish at least these two, but this language won't allow me. Of course, of course. So let, 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 let me say it a little bit more. In the, the point is that um, the point you, what we're using here, key, key here is that um, if a basis, let me call it B, uh, has cardinality. In general, this is a general result. If a basis has cardinality uh, lambda, or let, let, let me call it uh, mu, right? Then uh, the set of linear combinations of B, all linear, well, let me call the, 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 the span over K of B has cardinality smaller or equal than the maximum between mu and alex zero. At most, it grows to alex zero. So if I start with a basis which is finite, at most, I went to alex zero. My, my... Oh, of course, of course. Sorry, 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 sorry. You're, you're, you're totally right. You're, you're totally right. Mu bigger than, than, than the cardinality of k, right? Yes, 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 I agree. So, so here, I'm taking lambda bigger than k, right? Yes, bigger or bigger than one. Uh, well, I, I, I guess I could take this one as well, right? No, 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 sorry. No, no, I don't want it equal because it, I could have stayed in the left zero, and this I don't want. Okay, but so it has to be infinite on the zero again. Exactly, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, in, in case k is bigger than left zero. No, what, what, what I'm saying is, no, no, you're right. If, 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 if this k is uncountable, for example, is the real numbers or, the, or c, you could take this lambda to be precisely c because, because this remains true, right? This remains true if, if, if right? I mean, the, the, the span of this is going to be, it, it, it will be exactly the, the, the size of, uh, of, of your field. Right? If your field is uncountable. Uh, in order to not distinguish these cases, I just took some lambda big enough because I only need to be lambda categorical for some lambda, right? For my application. So don't you still need to be bigger than the lambda value of zero? Because you, I mean, uh, I mean you, you, you could have uh, like dimension two over an uncountable field. I mean, you, you, you want to make sure that your, your dimension is yeah. even bigger. Right. I mean, I mean, to ensure that you don't have it. Yes, but if 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 you're, I mean, if you're if you're if suppose let, let, let's take for example in 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 C, if you take two vector spaces over C, and they have cardinality, the same cardinality that C, I need to have a basis. Um, oh, you might be right, right? I'm, I'm saying something wrong. You're right, you're right, you're right. I, I, need, I need here, no, you're right, you're right. It's strictly bigger. That's correct, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I totally agree, sorry. I totally agree. Yes, 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 we, we need, this is correct, this is correct. Yes. And if you put bigger or equal, you cannot ensure that it's the same dimension. Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. Exactly. This is this, this, this is actually the the, the contrary example, right? <laughs> Sorry, you're right. No, no, no. I, I do need here something uh, strictly bigger. You're right. Okay. Yes. Because from the theory on the right, we know that it's complete. Yes. Then every two models. 
I agree. They they are actually isomorphic as. Uh, sorry, no, no, no. They're they're not isomorphic, right? Because the cardinality is not bigger precisely than the cardinality of the field. They're only elementarily equivalent. No. Yes. So each each of these two structures is a model of this theory. This theory only says that I am a vector space which is infinite over the real numbers. This is a vector space over the real numbers which is infinite, right? This is also a vector space over the real numbers which is infinite. So they're both models of this theory. You agree? Now, if the theory is complete, this means that any two models have to be elementarily equivalent. No, that was categoricity. They, they do have the same cardinality, but they don't need to be isomorphic. What we said here is that if they have cardinality bigger than your um, scalar field and also infinite, right? Then they are isomorphic. But these two here don't have cardinality bigger than, than the scalar, right? So they are not isomorphic, for sure not. This one has dimension one, this one, this one has dimension two. Because this theory is complete. So we said a theory is complete if and only if every two models of the theory are elementarily equivalent. Exactly, doesn't matter. This was the definition, I mean, this was the, the lemma that we proved at the very beginning was a theory is complete if and only if any two models have the same, uh, sorry, are, are elementarily equivalent. Exactly, this is the corollary here. We proved that if a theory was categorical in some language and only has infinite models, it has to be complete. And we just show here that well, we impose that this theory here only has infinite models by adding all these sentences. And we prove that it was lambda categorical for a big chosen cardinal lambda. But this is just to prove another thing. This was illegal. So we, we proved a theorem saying that if you are lambda categorical for some big cardinal lambda, or for some cardinal lambda, then your theory has to be complete. Exactly. This is what I wrote here as a corollary. We know that this theory has to be complete. And since it is complete, any two models have to be elementarily equivalent. This is why we have the three lines between these two. Yes? Yeah, what happens in practice when you discover that the language is is very poor. Is people trying to <laughs> That's a good. Also. So what, what what happens with modern theory when you discover that you cannot express very recently? That, 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 that's a good that's a good question. Then sometimes when the language is very poor, then you don't study very much uh, oh, vector spaces uh, this way, right? Yes. But sometimes even with a poor language, uh, you get uh, interesting results. Let, 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 let me give you some. Let me give you. Okay, I, I, I think I, I was a bit um, um, optimistic about my time management today, but let me let me give you let me let me give you other theories which are kappa categorical and which will imply being complete, which are less trivial, okay, than vector spaces. But the idea is very similar, okay. So unfortunately, the theory of uh, abelian uh, torsion-free groups is not complete because you can have um, such groups which are divisible and others which are not, right? right? For example, you can have, uh, well, Z is a torsion-free abelian group and Q also and one is divisible and the other is not. And this is expressible 
in first order. So this is still not, not complete. But nevertheless, if you add divisible, you end up with a complete theory. So theorem, the theory of uh, torsion free uh, divisible abelian groups is actually a uh, lambda categorical for every lambda bigger than Aleph zero and hence complete. Right, because we this is what's what's criterion says that it, if I am ah we, we know that this theory only has infinite models because it's torsion free. So any torsion free group has to be infinite. So by by both criterion, if we show that is lambda categorical for some lambda, then we know already it is complete. Right? Now let me let, let me try to I, I didn't state all the axioms for this theory. We just listed the ones for torsion free and abelian, but for divisible it's also easy, right? So in in the language of, of groups, which was let's say we're writing things multiplicatively, then um, then for example, the actions for divisibility are going to say that uh, for every x, uh, there exists some y such that um, x is oh sorry there exists some y such that let me write it properly because since i'm not using additive notation i have to think i want to divide x by n which is then saying that y to the n is x right this is this is basically saying i can have an n root in multiplicative notation for x right in additive notation this is saying just for every x for every y n y equals x, right? Oh, there exists, sorry, there exists some y. And then I'm saying that I can divide x by n, right? Is that an action for every exactly, I put an action for every natural number and bigger than y, exactly. So this theory, the theory of torsion free, let, let us give it a name, right? Uh, torsion free, DV, uh, what? Torsion free, uh, divisible everything group, something like this, okay? This is my theory T. <laughs> this is going to be kappa categorical. And the proof, actually, we just we just did it, right? Because let, let me just give a sketch. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to put every, every detail, but the sketch is that every such group can be seen as a Q vector space. Every such group, actually, the, let me say the models. of this theory, T, F, G, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with Q vector spaces. Right? If you give me any uh, torsion-free divisible abelian group, I can define you a vector space, and, and this is going to be one-to-one, -one, right? And we just saw that Q vector spaces, if I take something which is uh, of cardinality bigger than the cardinality, in this case, Q is also LF0, they will, they're going to be isomorphic. And if they are isomorph isomorphic as vector spaces, these are going to be also isomorphic as, as groups, okay? So, so a corollary, this is, this is a little bit more interesting. This, this group, it's elementarily equivalent to this one. Oh, right. And to this one. Actually, these two are isomorphic, right? Because of the completeness, right? Because all three groups are models of this, of this theorem. There are torsion-free divisible Davidian groups. Since the theory is complete, I cannot distinguish them by, by a first-order formula, right? Uh, let me give you a nicer, nicer, 
nicer theorem. Okay. Theorem. Let P be prime or zero. Then the theory of algebraically closed fields of characteristic P is also lambda categorical for lambda bigger than Aleph zero. And the last two are isomorphic by Bob's criterion, huh? Uh, well, both criterion, what's, what's, what gives me is that the theory is complete. They're just isomorphic by, by, by this axiom, by, by this, um, well, by this result, because these two have the same cardinality. And I am lambda categorical for any cardinal bigger than L2. Since these two have the same cardinality, they must be isomorphic. Right? Basically, the, the, the proof is as vector spaces take a basis as as Q vector spaces, of course. But as Q vector spaces gives me also an isomorphism as groups, just as. It's a terrible isomorphism. It's a terrible isomorphism, but. Exactly, exactly. It's a horrible isomorphism because it's, it's any bijection that you have between two bases as Q vector spaces. This is horrible, but it does, it does the job. Since the idea of construction is non standard complex numbers and so on. Mm. This is used by the sense. Yeah, I, I, I think this. Will you teach us this? I won't. <laughs> no, I won't be able to teach you this. But I'll, I'll give you some hints towards this type of construction. Uh, absolutely, but this you know. Of course, but, but you know for sure that there are going to be models of, of cardinality lambda. Well, at least one, at least one, because if, 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 it, is, if it is lambda categorical, there is only one model of isomorphism, but you know for sure that there is going to be one of cardinality lambda. Why? This is perhaps this is perhaps a, a question for everyone. Why why do we know at all that there are models of cardinality lambda for any lambda? Exactly. We just Lovingham's column. We we know that this theory has models. For example, Q, right? This theory has models. Has infinite models. It, it actually has only infinite models, but it has at least one, right? We know that there are uh, divisible torsion-free uh, abelian groups like Q. So the Lovingham scrolling theorem tells you that you can find models of this theory for any cardinality, because you will going to find elementary extensions of Q of every cardinality kappa. Right? So you know for sure that this is going to, I mean, this theory is going to have models in every lambda, actually. Yes. Well, it doesn't matter if there is just one, then you're happy because <laughs> this, exactly. I, I mean, by default, right? If, if, the, if there is just one, you're happy. I mean, but but okay. zero, um, I, I agree, I agree, but, but you, you <laughs> I agree, but you agree that this cannot happen, right? If you have one model of size alif zero, you have one model in every cardinality. Right? This is what Lovingham's calling tells you, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, then this is basically the same idea in these guys, but it's, it's basically exactly the same idea. Instead of using dimension as with bases, you use transcendence bases. And, and this is basically exactly the same thing. So let me just sketch the proof. Proof sketch. There we go. Uh, take, take two, two models, K and F, which are algebraically closed fields of a given characteristic, right? 
then let fp be their prime field. So it's either fp or if not q, right? Their prime field. Then take transcendence basis of uh, k, let's say b of k and b prime of k of f over the prime field, right? Since the cardinality of this lambda is bigger than aleph zero, the size of this transcendence basis has to be lambda. This is the same, exactly the same argument as with basis in in, in, in vector spaces. Um, uh, when you take a transcendence basis, well, basically you're trying to add perhaps all algebraic elements up to a transcendence basis to get your field, but this is only adding up to a left zero, right? This is not making bigger your cardinal. So we have that the cardinality of V and the cardinality of V prime have to be this lambda. Otherwise, they cannot be transcendence basis for, oh, sorry, I took these two models, sorry. Both of them, of course, of the same cardinality being lambda, right? This because I want to prove that two models of given cardinality lambda are isomorphic. But if I have uh, two such bases, then for sure what I'm, what I'm having is uh, an isomorphism between this one, uh, sorry, between this one and this one. And an isomorphism of fields extends to an isomorphism of their algebraic closures. This extends to an isomorphism of their algebraic closures. But since, uh, oh, sorry, this is FP, right? But since this is still FP, but since um, K was algebraically closed, this has to be K. And since F was algebraically closed, this has to be F. Right, because we have, let, let me perhaps write it here. Since B is uh, a transcendence basis, basis for K, what we have is that FPB sits, K sits between FPP and its closure. Right. This is the, the definition of a transcendence basis is that is uh, an extension. This is going to be purely transcendental, but then K is already in between this algebraic extension. This is the definition of being a transcendence basis. But since K is algebraically closed, these two have to be equal. Then we obtain an isomorphism between these two. Was this too fast or? This is perhaps, I mean, what I wrote here is really just algebra, right? I, I'm, I'm not doing really model theory there. It's just I'm using a bit of algebra to conclude something about this theory. But if you don't, for some reason, don't recall this or don't understand it, don't, don't worry. This is a bit of algebra saying that um, this, is, this is actually, I should have said, this is, this is a theory of uh, Steins. He, he was the first one noticing that any two algebraically closed fields with large cardinality, uh, equal cardinality, have to be, they have to be isomorphic. Isn't this the, the principle? This is what I, I would love to present. Uh, I was... Exactly. Notice that the, 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 P, the, the P here is fixed, right? 
So I'm only saying that each one of these theories is complete. I'm going to tell you about Lefschetz's principle in, in a second. Well, in a second, I'm not sure. Now I, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm not yet sure how we're going to do. In 10 minutes, we can do stuff. <laughs> but I, I still need some, some, something to do before presenting you the Lefschetz principle. So this method of categoricity, it's giving us um, a, lot of, a lot of examples of complete theories. This is not the only method to, to have uh, complete theories. Um, it is a very easy one. If you know, for some reason, um, a theory is categorical, then, um, then you know it is complete. Well, if, if it has only infinite models. Um, perhaps you want to think about, <clears throat> well, let, let, let me know, no, let's say about it and continue. I think in the notes, I also speak about, um, I mean, so far, the, the only examples that I gave you were algebraic examples, right? Um, but you can think of perhaps uh, the theory for, uh, let me put it here, perhaps, for L, just the language with one binary relation, uh, the theory of uh, dense, Ordered, ordered uh, sets without endpoints. This is a theory that you can easily express in this language, right? You say that you have a total order. This is just three axioms, four axioms, I, I guess. You say that it is an order, right? A, a reflexive. Uh, anti-symmetric and transitive, easy. Then you say that it is total, so for every x, either you have one or the other. Now you say it is dense, right? This is easy as well. For every two elements, you're going to find one in between. This is still expressible by a sentence. And you say that there is no element which is a maximum and no element which is a minimum, right? This theory that we call dense, uh, let me call it just dense linear orders and without endpoints, if, if you want. Doesn't matter. This gets uglier and uglier. But this theory is actually a left zero categorical. It's a this is a theorem of Cantor. But you can you can try to prove it by hand. Basically, it's saying that any two dense linear order without endpoints have to be isomorphic. It's a, it's a nice theorem. If, if you want to think about it, we can also discuss it later in this week. So this theory, for example, is also complete using what's criteria. It's an example of a complete theory, which is not um, coming from, from algebra. Mm -hmm. um, right. Let me. Okay. Right, okay. Now, in the last five minutes, let me give you the, <clears throat> let me give you the, the this is the, the, the main theorem of model theory. This is the theorem that whenever you see some flashy application of model theory behind somewhere, <laughs> It is going to be hidden this theorem, okay? This is called the compactness theorem. Let me give you the theorem, then I guess tomorrow we'll start with some applications of it. Um, so let uh, T be an L theory. And by the NL sentence, such that phi is a, an implication of T, then there exists 
Ah, uh, sorry, I, I want to, perhaps I want to, no, I want to phrase it differently. Sorry if, if, if I made you, if I made you write uh, things this, this way. Compacted theorem, I want to phrase it this way. Uh, let T be an L theory. Then uh, the models of T is non empty if and only if the models of T for every for every finite subset let me call it T zero of T. The class of models of T0 is non empty. Okay, let me phrase it like this. <coughs> and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a consequence of it. This is, let's say, compactness one, and let me give you compactness two. So this is, it, at first sight, it, it seems something kind of silly. We're saying that, well, of course, one direction is silly, right? If I have one model of T, for sure, this model of T is already a model of every finite bit, right? But if you think about the other way, this is already mysterious, right? It's saying that you give me just every finite possible part of uh, the sentences is T0. If I can find you models for this, then I'm producing suddenly a model for all the sentences that I have in T, right? This is... Of course, if my t is finite, this is it, it says it says nothing, right? But if t is infinite, then this is suddenly saying something strange, right? And the second formulation I want to give you about compactness is the one I was writing um, before. Is that let me put it compactness two here. Uh, this is still an L theory. Says that if um, uh, right. Let me put it like this. For phi an L sentence, um, T implies phi if and only if there is already a finite bit of T that implies phi. There is T0, a finite bit of T such that T0 already implies phi, okay? These two are actually equivalent. I think I, I'm going to put this in, a, in an exercise, but this is just two formulations of, of the same thing, okay? This is a bit of Tikhonov's theorem, a, a little bit. You're, you're right, this it's a little bit like this. You're, one, one could see it, uh, I mean, Tikhonov's theorem is indeed saying that product of compact is compact, right? Projective or projective limit of compact is compact. This is something similar. I agree. I, I kind of agree that this they have they have something in common. You're correct. Oh, thank you. Of course, there is T zero finite. Of course. Such that this is the most important part of the of the theorem. If I give you a sentence, mm -hmm. so can, can I, I take all the models, I declare them to be points, and now I give the sentence and the set of models that. So can you make a topology? Yeah, there is a topology hidden, but I I, I don't think we're we're going to get into so into that. Be able to deduce it from if if. If you phrase it in the right context, I think you can at some point use Tikhonov. But but the way you need to construct it, you won't avoid the proof of, of this. We're going to give a proof of this um, using some products, but it's not Tikhonov the theorems, which I'm, which we're going to use at some point. But, but we're going to use products to prove this at some point. Yes. Um, in the light of this theorem, now you can you can use this theorem to solve uh, this uh, question about 
if if the theory of the infinite set is finitely axiomatizable. For example, if there is a just one sentence uh, that axiomatizes being infinite, for example. Now this is this is the right kind of tool one can use to to prove that there is not, right? I, I already spoiled the exercise. We I, I said there is not going to be a single sentence which axiomatizes being infinite in the language, in the empty language. Now with this, we can really solve this. But when you first gave the exercise, uh, you didn't have this tool. So is it, is it possible? I, 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 we were discussing this uh, with uh, Christian these days. I think there is one possible way in the, in the way Javier was trying to, to do it. But right. This has to do with um, something that we will uh, cover perhaps on Friday, which is called quantifier elimination. So quantifier elimination is something saying that for a theory, a theory eliminates quantifier if any formula modulo this, th this theory is going to be equivalent to a quantifier free formula. This is something that we would like to know about a theory because it makes life easier in general. If we can derive for some, some reason that this theory, that the theory that we call the T infinity, which is just this list of axioms saying, I am bigger than N, bigger than N plus one and so on. If we can prove that this theory eliminates quantifiers, meaning that every formula, I mean, for every formula, let, let, me, let me express it. If we show that for every formula phi of x, right, there is a quantifier free formula psi of x such that my theory uh, it's it is a it implies that for every x it holds phi of x if and only if psi of x right this is what what this is exactly quantifier elimination that for any formula i can find a, another formula which is has no quantifiers, but with respect to the models of my theory, these two things are the same, right? This is what it means to eliminate quantifiers. This is just the definition. If if we can show this, which is which is true, I mean this 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 is going to be true, right? But if we can show this, then in particular, in particular, this means that every sentence has to be equivalent to a sentence without quantifiers. Yes? Is that supposed to be like just the parentheses around for every x, phi of x, if and only? The infinity is just, sorry, one, one second. The infinity is just the collection of all the formulas saying I am bigger than n. I have at least n elements, right? This T infinity was just this, the collection of all these formulas saying I have one, I have two, I have three. So the models of these are infinite sets, right? Any infinite model. No, any model, because if you are a model, you're infinite. You cannot, uh, you cannot be finite and satisfy all these sentences at the same time. Right? So any model, yeah. So any model has to be infinite. Exactly, that any infinite set, these two things are equivalent. Now, what was your question? Forget it. So I, I, I didn't, I mean, the, the quantifier, like, phi could have quantifiers and psi doesn't. That's exactly. Right. This can have quantifiers and this does not, right? Now, this implies in particular that if phi is a sentence, right, perhaps with, with quantifiers, so I have no x's, it has to be equivalent also to a sentence, but without quantifiers, right? There is a sentence without quantifiers such that, well, 
let me let me call this sentence this other psi right such that t implies that phi is equivalent to psi right but which are the in the language in the empty language right we're working in the empty language which are the sentences without quantifiers not even right because equal you need some variables but this is not a sentence there are actually only two exactly just true and false right these are the only two sentences that i can make without quantifiers right so either this is the truth or the false right and then we're saying that if this sentence is well, we're basically saying that you're, the sentence you're giving me, the, the, the sentence that is going to define being infinite, is modulo this theory either just true or false, right? And then with this, perhaps we can give an argument saying that this sentence cannot really uh, um, do what we what we want this sentence to do, right? You don't understand it. Perhaps I can explain this a little bit later. Yes, this is going to be true, right? But the problem is, how are we going to prove quantifier? Exactly. And some of the proofs for quantifier elimination <laughs> use compactness. That, that's the issue. Perhaps there is a proof of quantifier elimination, which is purely algorithmical and goes, goes through formulas, as Javier was asking. Too. like it really it's purely algorithmical it's not using compactness it's just going formula to formula trying to prove that this exists and this i think this procedure exists it's just i don't know it by heart and i haven't done it right um but if this procedure exists then i guess along this line we can also prove without using compactness that kind of right that, that's the the sketch exactly 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 but the issue is the way we prove quantifier elimination if quantifier elimination if what we used to prove quantifier elimination heating is using compactness well we're not really given a new proof if we manage to prove somehow quantifier elimination for this theorem in another way then you might have a proof of this fact without using compactness but this is just a um, minor detail. It's better if we at least all understand the proof using compactness, okay, of why this sentence cannot exist. Yes. Right. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. But let, let me finish then. Let me finish. So we're saying. Notice this. We're saying that, so suppose phi is such that um, if, um, if I have a model, if m satisfies phi, then m is infinite, right? Actually, we were supposing this, right? Right. And then in particular, right, this this means that well t this means this implies that well this has to be a a, a, a consequence of this one right mm -hmm. also the contrary for every for every formula let's say let's call these formulas uh, psi n right also for every psi n we also have that phi implies psi n, right? Because if I am a model of this, I am infinite, then of course I, I have also this part, right? Now, we said that this, um, let me perhaps, uh, right, we, we also said that this is, it has to be actually just um, uh, true. Right? It cannot be equivalent to false, right? If, 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 if this was equivalent to false, then th th this cannot happen because I have models uh, which <laughs> I have models of which are infinite sets, right? So it, this has to be just 
equivalent modulo t to 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 the truth right now what i'm saying here then is that basically that um okay let, let me try to finish properly Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, T infinity. This oh, okay. just just all these actions and for every psi n, all this is in T infinity, right? Uh, let me let me think for a second. I think I'm using I'm using already a. Yes, exactly. I'm, I'm I want to use that this psi is t, right? I mean, this is basically saying that t infinity is saying that phi is equivalent to just this is not a theory, but just the the, the truth, right? Like I want to, it, it, it seems I'm using compactness again. Yeah, you're right. Perhaps this is not, not enough. It, it seems I'm using already compactness on, at some point. <laughs> But you have also t infinity implies for all x phi of x and only x phi of x. Yes, exactly. But but since since phi is a sentence, there are no x's. So, so, so this is infinity says that phi is a exactly. Exactly, but but psi has no quantifiers, right? Then, then then the only thing that we have is that this implies so now you the can truth, say, you, right? You can here? No. Upstairs. You, yes. So what you know, we, we don't know the truth immediately, but we know that there exists the quantifier of the psi such that exactly. phi equals to psi. Yes, but and the, now, the only quantifier of free... has to be either true or false. Exactly. It has to be true. And it has to be true. Right. But but what, what is the what is the contradiction? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. You're right. It, it it seems here I'm using again compactness to derive a contradiction. Um Okay, let me think about it. Perhaps I'm using again compactness without without noting. So how would you finish it doing with compactness? Uh, with compactness, then if you have uh, if you have this, right, then this has to follow from finitely many of these, yeah. right? And then you will get finitely many of these psi n, right? That perhaps psi n up to some psi k, right? And this has to follow already. But this is definitely not the case because this only says that you have at most k elements. So you can have a model of k plus one, but in which this is not the case, right? If you have used compactness once, what are you, why, why don't you want to use it twice? You already used it. Uh, well, I, no, I have yet I, have, I, I haven't used it. This so is the first time I... I quantifier elimination. You thought that for quantifier elimination, you would use something on seven, but maybe... Exactly. Your way. Exactly, exactly. What I say is that th there is, <laughs> no, what I say is that there is for sure a way 
to prove quantifier elimination with compactness hidden. This I know, but I'm pretty sure that there is a way to prove quantifier elimination without compactness, just algorithmically. And I thought this was perhaps your idea, just looking formula by formula by an induction procedure. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. But he doesn't need to eliminate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I thought this was going to help, but my idea, I think, was uh, incorrect. Yes. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. I can, I can, I can forget about this and just apply compactness here, right? Compactness says that there are going to be just finitely many of these formulas psi n, right? From which I should deduce this, right? Exactly. This was a big roundabout for the same proof, but I, I thought perhaps we were going to to get somewhere, but I. I apologize. This, this, this perhaps might not work. And of course, this is already a contradiction. Yeah, you, you can take here something which has k plus one elements. It's a model of this because this only says I have more than k. But if I have k plus a elements, I cannot be a model of this one because this one says it should say I'm infinite, right? So that's the, the contradiction. Shall we take a break? And we we do some exercises after, right? Okay. A little bit behind my schedule, but not not too much. <laughs>